Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today's video is all about cashmere. We discuss what it is, touch on the history, the environmental impact, tell you what to look for when you buy it, what quality a cashmere is, what crap cashmere is, do's and don'ts, and how to take care of it. <laughs> Cashmere today is easily taken for granted. In recent decades, the price of cashmere at department stores has gone down and down, and so more people have been able to acquire it. At the same time, high quality cashmere remains one of the most luxurious fibers you can find to this day. So what exactly is cashmere? It is super soft, and it is a fiber which is the under hair from the cashmere goat, and Usually, a goat can only produce about 150 grams a year, which is only about a third of a pound. It is only the fine under hair that has a very narrow diameter, which makes the fiber very soft to the touch. To protect the term cashmere, the US government has the Wool Product Labeling Act, which says that in order for it to be called cashmere, it has to be 19 microns in diameter or less. It can only have up to 3% of cashmere fibers that are more than 30 microns, and it has to come from the de-haired goat and only from the under hair of the cashmere goat. Cashmere is called that way because the goats traditionally lived in the Kashmir region in Asia. Today, you can find cashmere goats in other places such as Mongolia, but you need to have a certain elevation which creates that fine under hair that is so prized. Cashmere has been exported from Asia in the 1800s, but to learn more about the history, please check out our in-depth guide on the website here. Today, about 70% of all cashmere in the world comes from China, 20% comes from Mongolia, and 10% comes from other places. The climate in this central part of Asia is extreme in terms of heat and cold, which leads to the development of that fine under hair in the cashmere goat. Traditionally, cashmere fibers are harvested just once a year during springtime, and there are two ways to get it. The first method is combing, which is much more high quality, but more labor intensive. It's done by hand, and the hair is physically combed out. It results in a higher quality cashmere because you mostly only get the under hair fibers which are desirable, not the guard hairs. Option number two is shearing, where a machine is used to cut both the guard hair and the fine under hair, and the problem is you have both combined which yields in a lower quality cashmere that's not as soft. In China and Mongolia, where labor costs are really low, combing is still the number one method of harvesting. If you go to New Zealand or Australia, you will more likely to encounter shearing. Once the cashmere fibers are harvested, they're forwarded onto the processors. It has to be sorted and washed, and longer cashmere fibers are more desirable than shorter ones because they create a more even yarn that is less prone to pilling. Today, less expensive cashmere that you find at malls and a scarf for maybe like just 20 bucks means that you get the very short fibers and even though they're soft, after you wear them a few times and there's some friction, you will encounter pilling, which is very unattractive. Because cashmere is so fine, it is often spun not just into one yarn, but different yarns are spun into multiple yarns. The process of combining those yarns is called ply. So you may find two ply, which means two yarns have been spun together, which results into a more uniform, more resistant, and higher quality yarn. With cashmere though, for example, for sweaters, you sometimes see three ply, four ply, six ply, all the way up to nine ply or 10 ply. As you can imagine, with the plies, the weight goes up, but it's also a higher quality. So if you have a sweater out of a 10 ply cashmere, chances are it's gonna cost you 800 or $1,000. Unfortunately, the ply term is not really protected, so unless you can trust the source, if you see a 10 ply label, it doesn't always mean it's actually a 10 ply. It could just be a six ply and you just don't know it because you don't have the means to test it. Historically, cashmere was introduced to the US on a large scale in 1947. And up until the 70s, when China passed some trade laws, it was a really rare commodity. Because it was so popular and fetched such high prices, more and more shepherds decided to have cashmere goats. Now, that had a substantial environmental impact. 
goats are herding animals, and as such, they move on. The problem is their hoofs pull up the roots of the grass in nomadic desert areas in Central Asia, and because of that, they're responsible for the expansion of the desert in those areas. As more and more cashmere goats have appeared, they've eaten more and more of the grass and pulled out more and more of the roots until there was nothing left and they had to move on. Because of that, Mongolia's grasslands have degraded by 65%. As a consequence, sand and dust storms now plague central parts of Asia, thus impacting the livelihood and the health of the people there. So what does it mean for you? Ideally, you invest only in the highest quality cashmere because that will last the longest and therefore you don't have to rebuy cashmere scarves every season, thus impacting the desert growth in Central Asia. So what's the best quality cashmere? One, it's from combed goats, it's from Mongolia or China, it's about 14 to 16 microns in diameter, and it's 50 millimeters long, which is about two inches. As I said, the higher the ply, the better. So how can you buy quality cashmere? Actually, I've always found it was extremely difficult to find out more information about cashmere, especially when you shop online, but also in stores. Sales clerks don't know what they're talking about, and people just say, oh, it's quality cashmere. Most of the time, you don't learn about the plies, you don't learn about the fiber length, they can't even tell you where it is sourced, and as such, you should only buy cashmere from a retailer where you can return it after a while, especially if you encounter pilling after a few times of wear. Now that being said, even the highest quality cashmere will pill eventually. It will just happen much later. And pilling is usually encountered in areas of high friction. For a sweater, for example, underneath the arms. Of course, you as a consumer can use common sense because you're not gonna get a super high quality cashmere scarf for 50 bucks or for $5 on the street, that is simply a deal that's too good to be true. So always check if your retailer provides good enough information about cashmere. And we try to do that on our website when we have our scarves, for example, or our gloves, because we wanna make sure that we source quality cashmere that stands the test of time. So what should you do and don't do when it comes to cashmere? First of all, don't be fooled by gauge numbers when it comes to cashmere, they don't matter. Do expect that a retailer should explain to you why their cashmere costs as much as it does. Don't buy cheap disposal cashmere that has to be renewed every season and instead do buy quality cashmere in timeless patterns and colors that you can wear from now for years to come. Do consider the cost per wear for cashmere, especially if you plan to wear it for 20 years from now. Do buy cashmere products that best utilize the characteristics of the material. Cashmere is very soft and therefore it's great for sweaters, scarves, linings, even ties. However, it's not suited for suits or pants because in the area around your thighs, there's too much friction and it will peel very easily. Also, if you go for cashmere socks, it makes sense to blend it maybe with silk or some other fibers to give it more strength while maintaining its softness. When it comes to jackets, do buy 100% cashmere sport coats, such as the one I'm wearing here right now. It's very soft. Or go with suits that have merino wool blended with cashmere to add extra softness. Don't buy cashmere that is blended with polyester or nylon because usually it's a very low quality cashmere and you'll regret your purchase soon thereafter. Last but not least, how do you care for cashmere? Unlike cotton, it is normally not machine washable and is a hand wash only item. I'd also try not to dry clean it if you can avoid it. Instead, you can get a baby shampoo and gently wash it by hand and then pat it dry with a cotton towel and let it air dry gently, ideally on a hanger, unless it's a sweater that should be dried flat. Alternatively, you can also purchase low alkaline detergent, which is perfect for cashmere. Once you wash cashmere and it's dried, it may feel a lot stiffer, so you have to kind of crunch it and make it soft, maybe iron it and steam it and wear it a little bit, and it will regain its original softness. In today's video, I'm wearing a 100% cashmere jacket by H. Freeman and Sons, which I found at a vintage flea market for just 20 bucks. 
It has a classic Prince of Wales check pattern, which nice tones of brown, beige, and mustard yellow, which is perfect for the fall winter season. As such, it pairs really well with my dark chocolate brown Polar Ralph Lauren cotton corduroy slacks and my wool vest. For my shirt, I chose a custom shirt made out of a light blue cotton flannel. And even though it is very soft, it is not cashmere, but it almost feels like it. I combined it with a solid brown cashmere tie, which is generally thicker than a silk tie, and it pairs particularly well with fall winter outfits. I tried to keep the color scheme very muted, brown and fall-like. The pocket square is from Fort Belvedere. It is wool and printed in England, and it picks up the colors of the blue in the shirt and the burgundy of the waistcoat. To run out the fall character, I paired it with Tricker's boots in a nice tan cognac color. I added contrasting boot laces from Fort Belvedere to just create a little more interest. My socks are a cashmere silk blend. They are a prototype from Fort Belvedere and they're dark green. However, with boots that reach over the ankle, you'll rarely ever see the socks. My cufflinks are eagle claw cufflinks from Fort Belvedere with a tiger's eye, which is a very nice brown and yellow changing look to it, which goes exceptionally well with my jacket and my pants, as well as my shoes. In line with that, I have a ring, which is not a pinky ring because it's too big for my pinky finger, so I'm wearing it on my ring finger, and it works well with the cufflinks, as well with all the other brown tones in my outfit. If I'd go outside, I'd wear a scarf with it, such as this Fort Belvedere scarf in a nice mustard yellow that is very seasonally appropriate. For gloves, most of our gloves have a cashmere lining and you can check out all Fort Belvedere accessories in our shop here. Thanks for your support and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to sign up for a free email newsletter so stuff like this comes right to your inbox. <laughs>